she is? This is Sue Stevens, right? And Sue and Mike Stevens uh, were uh, um, all of their adult lives planting churches in uh, Costa Rica and Ecuador. And so they retired here in St. Augustine, and, and uh, we were really blessed to have them as part of our body here. God called them back into ministry, into a church at Costa Rica that Mike and Sue planted themselves. And so they've been pastoring that church. And uh, they're in here for a couple of days, and so she is going to update us on all of the wonderful things that God is doing through them in Costa Rica. My, my first question is, uh, you're ministering in Costa Rica, why no tan? Because we live in San Jose, which is, and in the middle of rainy season, so okay. there isn't a lot of sun. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, okay, can we go ahead with the first slide? Let's see, code word. Okay, so yes, this is the view in the morning from our apartment. Those of you who heard us speak, be, let me speak the last time, and by the way, there's lots of new faces, which is really exciting, and uh, I knew that our only window looked into a garage, so we've changed places, and this is the view we have now. Uh, this is the head elder of the church. Our mission has kind of changed a little bit. We went there initially to help restore a pastor who had uh, fallen to help restore him into ministry, and our ministry has changed a little bit so that we are training up some Costa Rican leaders, uh, different leaders to take over and pastor the church. This is the head elder. And he painted this, <laughs> this is the logo of the church, and he painted it outside. You can see it's not grand or glorious. We don't have flags, but anyway. <laughs> and uh, this is him again with us, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about him. He, um, Mike, he was an outlaw, really. He was a very corrupt policeman. He uh, dealt drugs. He helped the gringos that fly to San Jose to use the legal prostitutes, help them find whatever they wanted. I mean, he was, he was a mess. I can't even begin. Oh, he didn't, was unfaithful to his wife many, many, many times. And he told God that he would listen to God if he found someone doing magic, a, a, a pastor doing magic in the street. Okay? And that happened because Mike and Brent, who, when we were there before, uh, had a, like a Christian magic act that they would do to gather crowds and evangelize. <laughs> and so, uh, so he received Christ, and he has not looked back from the plow. It's just amazing. So uh, he's just such a rock for the church. Okay. Don't worry, I'm not taking this much time on all the slides. This is a class in the place we had first. You can't, I just wanted to show you the space. There's three more people in there and then people sitting on the bed, which is in our bedroom looking into the room. Uh, so uh, we had very little space there. And they were still faithful. They were perched on these stools. That's me teaching in that, in that locale. Um, and now we're, this is the view from at night from our place. This was the first time they came to class um, there, and they are just sponges. This is the main leadership team, uh, and they just want to learn. These people have full-time jobs, are traveling, most of them, by bus uh, places. They come to all the services all of the classes we offer, we're offering three Bible college classes right now, and they never miss. Almost all of them, one guy missed because he had a family member die. He missed one class one day, and uh, everyone else got like perfect attendance for the first semester. And uh, you, oh, Mike teaching on a Saturday. We have one class on a Saturday after evangelism. We'll look at that later on. That's going really well. And uh, 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 another course that he teaches. So we have a small core of really faithful people who just want to soak up the Bible and come to everything. Uh, this is Stanley. I had to show you Stanley. Stanley has lots of mental issues and is on very 
strong psychotropic drugs that cause him to kind of stare out at the world. He wasn't able to finish uh, high school, but he comes faithfully to the Bible college classes, and this is him receiving a certificate as an oyente, auditor, auditor of a class, because he didn't miss any. And, uh, and this is the, the faithful group that just comes to all the classes, we're amazed how much they want to absorb God's word. Uh, see, this is what happens around noon. <laughs> So this is why no tan. In the mornings, we're usually studying. Sometimes we go out to grab a cup of coffee and read a devotional together. And then in the afternoons, we're walking around in the rain. Uh, this is Mike. At, we, there's a drug rehab center that attends our church. It's wonderful. We just love these guys. And this is Mike teaching. And please pray that we can have more teaching opportunities at this uh, drug rehab center. These guys study the Bible for at least three hours a day. It's a year-long program. If they complete the year-long program, they can stay for another year. It's free. Uh, they can stay for another year and receive a free Bible college education uh, and, so, and be ordained. It's very compact. So it, it's an astounding program. This is our fledgling uh, women's group. Our church has a lot more men than it does women. This is most of the women that attend the church. And uh, so uh, we just started that up. Mike was really em he emphatic that we have a women's ministry. I don't know why, because he normally isn't. But he doesn't know why either. He just felt like God was leading him in that way. This is evangelism. Every Saturday we go out and evangelize. It's just delightful. We usually have about eight people. And uh, you can go to the next one. Uh, eight people. We just sit and talk to people in the park and ask them, well, how do you think you get to heaven? You know, what is, what is your, what do you think the method is to know that you can get there? And most people are delighted to sit down and have a talk. So that is wonderful. Uh, oh, can you go back one? This is, we had a baptism at the beach. Uh, most of the guys getting baptized were uh, from the center, from the drug rehab center, a few from our church. Amazing. These are all the people who are getting baptized and a few of the leaders out there. Uh, it was just delightful. This, this young man was just so excited. All of them were. They were just beside themselves, uh, and it was a delightful day. Uh, this is our music team. The, the man on the right, Alan, is also part of the uh, leadership team. He just loves God and has a, a special gift for leading people into very deep worship, and it's, it's delightful. On Wednesday nights, we have an hour of prayer and praise, uh, and then Mike teaches a class afterwards, and it's amazing. Everyone drags in, not that there's that many people there on the Wednesday night, but they drag in exhausted from their day at work, and they leave bouncing. It's just amazing. And this is our church uh, that we rent from another church. This is a multi-purpose room of a church. Uh, we normally, this is the guys at the drug rehab. I don't know if it, it'll play the video or not, but there's a little clip of them singing, which, oh, no, that's fine. And, uh, but they, they just love God. They're so worshipful and and we, we love, they add so much to our church. Oh, visitation. Visitation comes in many ways and forms. This is uh, Louisa and I, we're, we were visiting a man in our church who wants to turn some property of his into a retreat for Christians. And he wanted us to stand on the property and pray for it, which was great, except for the cow pies, which we all ended up with on our shoes. Uh, so anyway, and this is Fabricio. We'd known he was in our church when we were there for four years earlier, and uh, 2012 to 2016. And we had lunch with him recently, and Mike was going to uh, confront him about the fact that he hasn't been coming to church, even though he says he wants to be there. 
And then we found out uh, through conversation before that came up that he has no money. He had to borrow bus fare to get to us. He can't walk to church because he's surrounded by dangerous neighborhoods. He said the last time that he came to church, he just got down on his, he wanted to get down on his knees and cry out of thankfulness that he'd arrived there. There aren't a lot of churches who teach grace down there. There's a lot of churches, but not a lot. They're mostly very legalistic. So he's a delight. And this is a family that we visited because the girl on the left here had been cutting herself and also been suicidal. And we had a really wonderful time of ministry there. And this is the view at night from our place. So that's it. Question, why do you think there are more men than women? Because it's kind of the opposite here. I don't have the foggiest idea, but I love it. Should I turn it off? I don't know. What's that? He said, why do you think there's more men than women? Because it's kind of the opposite here. And I said, I don't have the foggiest idea, but we love it. Awesome. Just to, all these men to train up as leaders, and it's just delightful. Okay, we got one question from Don. Do most of the Indians? No. Do you have interpreters here? Well, we speak Spanish well enough to preach and teach. And, uh, and Can you say in Spanish, uh, the pastor is handsome? Can you say that? <laughs> El pastor es muy guapo. Amen. <laughs> Good to have you. Awesome, man. It's uh, that's impressive, you know, to be in a to be in a place like that where you know not only are you counseling people that are cutting themselves, but you're discipling people, you're evangelizing people, and what an impact. So we're ha you know what, and they're like our first missionaries. Look, this is like our, we're a new church, and they're our first missionaries, and so we're very happy to support them. So, thank you. Thanks for being here. All right. I think we have a uh, a little video. All right, Luke fourteen. You ready? Get your Bibles. Luke 14, just a couple of verses, verses 34 and 35. All right. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, it is a, a wonderful thing that you choose people like us, flawed, faulty, to do this incredible thing uh, called the ministry of the gospel of Jesus Christ. <coughs> Father, thank you for what you do through Mike and Sue. And Father, thank you for what you do through us as well. <clears throat> Although we may not be missionaries or pastors or... Father, you have created the body of Christ in such a way. Each one of us have become effective ministers for you. Father, move us to that end as we study your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I have... <clears throat> 14, surfboards. Idolatry? Maybe. Some of them I use and some of them I don't. In fact, there's one that uh, will never touch ocean water again. I will never apply wax to this one surfboard ever again. And the reason is, is because it's hanging on my wall in my living room. That was my contribution to... The, de the decor in my house, to my, my wife's chagrin. So I have this board, but now the, the reason that board is special, it's a classic, it's a 10-foot Hanson. The reason it's special is because that was my father's board. It was the board that he retired, and it was the board that he taught me to surf on when I was six or seven. So I inherited the board, and I, so I gladly display it. It's a beautiful piece of wall art. Now, I have other surfboards in my garage that I use. They're useful. They're, they're functional. I actually surf on them. So one is wall art. Others are functional. Which pretty much describes the church, doesn't it? Because we're like surfboards. 
Some of us are wall art. Some of us are actually useful. <laughs> Which one are you? Well, that's what we're going to ask. We're going to answer that question this morning is, what is the reason that God created us? What is the purpose that he has uh, placed upon our lives as individuals in the body of Christ? Right? Because he didn't create us and didn't save us to be wall art. He created us and he saved us to actually do something. Luke chapter 14, remember the context. Christ is traveling along, and as he's walking along towards Jerusalem, there's a crowd behind him, as we saw last week. And so the crowd, uh, as they're following him, he turns to the crowd. Kevin, can I get a little bit more monitor here, please? He turns to the crowd, and he says to them, um, uh, are you sure? Are you sure you want to follow me? Because if you're going to follow me, uh, this is what it's involved. He says, I am going to be the priority. And if I'm not the priority, right, basically don't bother. He said some, something very disturbing last week. Remember, he says, unless you hate your family, you can't be my disciple. It, unless you hate your own life, you, you, you can't be my disciple. And so we found last week that that kind of shocking language was essentially saying that if I'm the priority, then everybody else is kind of like a like a distant second. And when you put things and people in a distant second, things that perhaps used to be number one, that causes trouble. That brings challenges. There's a cost involved there. Like if you take people who used to be like in a top priority position in your life and you replace them with Jesus Christ, people are going to get angry. That's why sometimes family... When you come to Christ, the people that are closest to you, they don't jump on board. They're, well, you're, you're kind of a weird Jesus freak now. You're going to church every Sunday. We don't, we don't like that. Also, if, uh, if I decide that Christ is the number one position in my life, then it gives me a new relationship with the things of this world, with stuff. And so what I find is that, is that as I embrace Jesus Christ and I make him number one, my grip on the stuff of this world loosens. And it's not like God has to pry my fingers open to get me to let go of stuff. He doesn't. He doesn't do that with me. He basically just shows me the value in Jesus Christ. And as I find the value in him, it's priceless. What happens is I begin to just let go of the stuff that I, I used to think was priceless and, 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 and uh, worthwhile. You know, we sang this morning, uh, turn your eyes upon Jesus, right? Look full in his wonderful face. And, and th how does it go? And then the things of this earth grow what? Strangely dim. Do you see what he's saying there? If you're looking at him, if you grab hold of him, all of a sudden you realize this is more valuable than anything else in life. So you let go of stuff. That's what the Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter 3. He says, you know what? He says, I've, I've, I consider the loss of all things that I might gain Christ. Because in him, there's so much value. Everything else to me is like, it's like garbage. Make him the priority. And watch how he drives you to let the worthless stuff of life go. So, last passage, he talks about the priority of the Christian life. This week, he talks about purpose. He moves from priority that if Jesus Christ is number one, if he's the priority of my life, then that brings purpose. Let's go to our passage. Look at verse 34. He says this. Therefore, salt is good, but even if salt becomes tasteless, with what will it be seasoned? It is useless either for the soil or the manure pile, so it's thrown out. The one who has ears to hear, let him hear. Well, that seems like a kind of a random passage to follow our last passage. Remember when he was talking about the cost of discipleship and following him, and then he just kind of breaks into, uh, therefore, if salt is good, it becomes tasteless, uh, what will be seasoned? You think, well, that's kind of a random transition. That's kind of a disconnect, not really. Because the word therefore connects the prior passage with this passage. Again, 
He was talking about the priority of Jesus Christ in our lives. And if he is the priority, therefore, he talks about purpose. And he talks about purpose. He introduces the subject of purpose by talking about salt. And he says, uh, you know, what's the purpose of salt? What does it do? It enhances flavor. It makes things taste good. Right? Too much salt? Oh, you can't eat it. But just the right amount of salt, boy, it really makes food delicious, doesn't it? It makes it tasty. That's the purpose. That's what its function. That's, that's why it exists. And the passage says, well, if, if it doesn't function as salt, if it doesn't make things taste better, then what do you do? You throw it out, you manure pile, or throw it in the trash can. So is he talking about salt here? I mean, really. Does he want us to know what the purpose of salt is? Is that where he's going? No. <laughs> he's talking about us. Because when you and I make Jesus Christ the priority, you discover the purpose for which he created you. The purpose of salt is to make things taste better. So let me ask you a question. What is your purpose? Why are you here? Why did God create you? Isn't it interesting that we can look at something as simple as salt and we know exactly what it's for? It has a purpose. Its purpose is to make things taste better. We all know that. And it's salt. What is your purpose? Why are you here? Why did Christ save you? If we can understand the purpose of salt and how simple is salt, how much more complex and a wonder of creation are we created in the image of God? Can you answer that question? How complex we are. How much more complex are we than salt? But when you look at us and you ask people the question, why are you here? What's the purpose? Why did God create you? If I were literally to ask you that question, I think I'd probably get a blank stare for most. True. And you're scratching your head thinking to yourself, I'm not sure how I'd answer that question. Well, why did he save you? Well, he, he saved me uh, because uh, for salvation's sake. Well, yeah, that's true. And he saved us, you and I, to be reconciled to God. Christ died on the cross to pay for my sin. Why? So that the penalty of that sin, the punishment condemnation and judgments for that sin would no longer rest on me, but on Jesus Christ. And so when Christ was dying on the cross, he was bearing the judgment for the sin of every human being. And then God makes this wonderful offer. If you believe that, if you accept that Christ died for your sin in your place, you believe that. The moment you believe that, your sin is forgiven, and you are given eternal life. It is not by anything that you do. It is simply by faith. Is that why God saved me? Yes, he did. He saved me for salvation's sake, but that's not all. Because the thinking sometimes as a believer is we think, okay, I got my fire insurance, baby. I'm good to go. And I shift back, and I just cruise through life, you know, hoping one day that the rapture comes soon, or you know, looking forward to the, And I just kind of sit back on the couch, and I twiddle my thumbs until the day Christ takes me home. Is that why he created you? Was that why he saved you? Did he save you merely for salvation's sake? Well, he did save you to save you. But he saved you to serve him. He saved you to serve him. That's where your purpose 
is found. That's why he designed you. That's why he engineered you. That's why you are his workmanship, his craftsmanship, created uniquely, unlike anybody else who ever walked the face of this earth. You were unique, and he created you, and then he saved you for a reason. Not to sit on the couch and wait for the rapture. To be useful. Not wall art. So if I were to ask you this morning, what is the purpose for which God saved you? I'm guessing most of you would go, I don't know, honestly. I just don't know. My wife finds me attractive. When I have power tools in my hand. So I did what any reasonable husband would do. I bought a bag of power tools. Right? Now there's an assortment of power tools in here with different purposes and different functions, for instance. I call these the marriage enhancers. I've got a jewel driver and I've got an impact driver, right? And sometimes I put these on a tool belt and just walk around the house. And <laughs> does wonders. Okay, so I've got a, uh, I've got a circular saw here. I mean, these are so useful. Any cut, any kind of piece of wood, great. You can't live without a circular saw. Amen. You want to build anything, you need a circular. Okay, here's another one, too. He's a, this is actually my favorite. This is what, it, what you call a reciprocating saw or a sawzall. I mean, these things are always wonderful. And, 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 and like I had a tree, and the, and, 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 and the roots were coming into the paver section, and so I cut the roots out. Reciprocating saw, awesome. Now, I have another tool here. Let me put this down. I have no idea what this thing is. It came in the package, right? And uh, uh, it's a very cool tool. I don't know what you call it. What, do you, what is it called, Oscar? A multi-tool. You just guessed at that? So, yeah, so, I mean, it, it's got... It had a little sandpaper attachment thing to it, so I guess maybe, I don't know, but it's got a little dial here on the center, and, and uh, I mean, I guess it's, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful thing of, crea I mean, the manufacturer engineered this thing, and he applied physics to this, and wonderful engineering behind this, this tool, but I, folks, it sits on my tool bench, that's it, like, I don't use it, I'm not sure what it does. I don't know its purpose. All right. So the church is kind of like a bag of tools, except we're a church of tools. Right? Some of you, some of you are uh, impact drivers. Some of you are drill drivers. Some of you are circular saws. Some of you are, you know, reciprocating saws. And uh, because we're each designed different, uh, with, with different functions, we do different things in the body of Christ. And the one tool that I do not want to be, I don't want to be that tool. You know why I don't want to be that tool? Because I have no idea what that thing does. I don't want to be that tool. Think about the intricate design of my life that he created me. Gave me a brain. I live, I breathe, I move. Why? Why did he give me life? What, what is the purpose? Why am I here? Paul answers a question in Ephesians chapter 2. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Have you ever heard that verse before? Boy, that's a great verse, isn't it? Committed to memory, awesome verse. By grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, it's not by works, right? Verse 9, he says, not as a result <coughs> excuse me, of works, so that no one may boast. We get that. 
Isn't that great? We're saved through faith. It's a gift from God. It's not by works. I can't earn it. I can't do anything for it. It's, it's, it, it's simply a gift. But have you ever read verse 10? For we are his engineering, workmanship. Watch this. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's your purpose. That's your purpose. Why did he craft me? Why did he engineer me? Why am I his, his workmanship? And what am I supposed to do all that? Created in Christ Jesus for what? For good works, for service. Now watch what he says. Which God prepared beforehand, before you were even born, so that we would walk in them. So he's got this plan laid out for my life, filled with purpose, the things that he has called me to do, and it, and it all has to do with the person of Jesus Christ. And he's laid it out before I was even born so that I might fulfill those things and I might do those things. I got some friends uh, years ago who uh, uh, planned a European vacation. They're going to go to Italy. They're going to go to Germany. They're going to they're go all over this thing. So right before they leave, she got like deathly ill. And they had to cancel the trip. They didn't buy uh, travel insurance. So all this trip that had been planned out that they were going to go see uh, never happened because of illness. What a waste. What has God prepared for my life? What are the things that he wants me to do? What are the things that he has called me to accomplish that he's laid out? Folks, don't miss that. If you do anything in this life, folks, don't miss that. Because that's where your purpose is. So if you're living life and you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to, I don't know, no, no, no. that's your purpose. Well, then, okay, so if I don't know what my purpose is and God hasn't told me, what's the problem? The problem is disconnect. You are detached. Huh. Because the closer you are to Jesus Christ, the clearer his calling. In essence, Christ doesn't shout your calling. He kind of whispers. And it's in that whisper that you hear the calling, but you can only hear him if you draw close to him. So how do you discover the purpose? Basically, you walk with God. And the closer you walk with God, your relationship with Jesus Christ is close and intimate because you're, you're meditating upon his word and you're praying and you're spending time walking by the Spirit. You're working on that relationship. You're nurturing that relationship. The closer I am to Jesus Christ and my walk with him, the clearer the calling. I understand why he created me and what he wants me to do because there will be this compelling desire to do it. You have no choice. i got to do this. Christ describes the, the issue of attachment and detachment in John 15. Watch what he says. He says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Isn't that cool? I mean, he says, abide in me, and I, well, what does that mean? Well, let me use the illustration of a vine and a branch. So he says, you understand what a vine is. You understand what a branch is. It's the same thing with my relationship with you. If you abide in me, and I abide in you, <clears throat> you can't do anything. Watch what he says in verse 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do Nothing. Right? Whatever he has called me to do is made clear to me as the branch is attached to the vine. I am the branch, and he is the vine. So if I don't know what he wants me to do, I have no clue about what he created me to do, the problem is, is you're disconnected, is that there's a detachment from the vine. Because once you're detached from the vine, you're not going to be able to bear any fruit. You can't do anything. It's just an issue of reattaching to the vine. Do you remember when we used to use cordless phones? Any of you who still use those things? Remember it had the, one had, it had the base with an antenna and it had the handset with the antenna? It was the greatest thing because before that, right, you had that 
curly cord that was attached to the phone, if you're old enough to remember that. Right? And, and you couldn't go anywhere. Now, attached to a cordless phone, boy, you could walk around the house, or you could talk you outside. Right? But here's the thing with a cordless phone. The further away you were from the base, what happened to the call? It became less clear. It was distorted. It was hard to talk. It was hard to, to hear. The fir- but the closer you came to the base, what happened? The clearer the call. Do you see the connection? The closer I am to Jesus Christ, the clearer the call. So it's not like, well, God hasn't told me what he wants me to do. He hasn't done that. Okay, you know what you do? It's really simple. Really simple. Just attach yourself to the vine. (laughs) You'll have no choice. And sometimes the things that he calls you to do, the purpose you have for your life, is really not in your area of strength. He may call you to do something that scares you literally spitless. I said spitless. Seriously, right? Uh, Guess what my worst class was in college? Public speaking. And when I got to graduate school, guess which classes were my least favorite? Preaching classes. If, if, you're, if you hated getting up in front of people and talking, I hated it twice as much as you did. And interesting, I spent the last 32 years doing the very thing that I scared me to death because God created me for this. And folks, even to this, after 32 years of doing this, you think, oh, you're, you got it down. No, you know something? I'm really not good at standing in front of people talking. That is why... I have to over-prepare because I'm not good at it. That's why I don't look at my notes. And I'm not saying this boastfully. I don't look at my notes, folks, because I got that thing memorized. Even when I ad-lib, I'm not ad-libbing. It's in my manuscript. And so, but the truth of it was, it was here was I got out of college and I started spending time alone with God for the first, I mean, it's the pastor's kids. And I, first time I got, I got alone with God and I would read the word before I went to work and I would pray and I would, and it took six months of doing that for God to, to, for me to understand what God's call was and I quit work and went to seminary. It's God's calling, right? But not only are you, does he give you the ability to do it? You're effective only because he's working through you. But the truth of it is, the only, your only desire to do anything that he called you to do comes from him. He gives you the will, and he gives you the desire. Look at Philippians chapter 2. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but, all, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now watch what he says. For it is God who is at work in you, both to will and to work for his good Pleasure. To will and to work for his good pleasure. He calls me to this. He gives me the ability to do it. But then he also gives me the desire. The only reason why I want to serve him is because the spirit of Christ living inside of me is compelling me to do it. And as I walk with him, that's my desire. I want to fulfill this calling that he placed upon my life. And you know something I can tell sometimes in the ebb and flow of the spiritual walk in my life? When I'm ebbing, my desire to do what he wants me to do goes out the window. Boy, it happens quick. Right? I mean, you know, being a minister, do you, are you always like, oh, let's do this. Let's pass. You know, you're passionate about spiritual things. And, yeah, yeah, listen, I'm human. And sometimes that desire is just not there. And that's when I realize my problem is not that I've lost my calling. The problem is I'm detached. I've got to reattach because it's from that attachment. It's from that source. The nourishment comes. The desire comes. He is the one who works through me. Okay. We're out of time. I've got to cut this short. We are observing... The Lord's table today, because what you and I are commanded to do through Scripture is to remember the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made 
for us. He made that sacrifice so that you and I would be reconciled to God. That was his purpose. That's why God sent him <coughs> to this world. Excuse me. For one reason, and that was to be the sacrifice for our sins. He was the perfect sacrifice. And when he did that, <clears throat> he recognized, I think, something about us. And that was is that we are forgetful. And so what he says is he institutes this communion table, and he says, listen, as often as you get together, as you get together, I want you to remember what I did for you. And that's what the Lord's table is. It is simply a time when you and I gather together with other Christians, and we spend time remembering what Christ did for us so that we might be with him. That's why we're doing this. The Lord's table does not provide you a favorable standing before God, doesn't ingratiate you before God, you're not uh, improving your position before God. It is just simply a time of remembrance with God's people. I'm going to invite you to come on up, and we have, uh, I think, some women who are going to assist in handing out some of the elements. And so uh, come on up, take your elements, and then go back to your seat, and then wait, because we're going to observe the Lord's table together. So come on up. First Corinthians 11, verse 23, he says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Shall we eat together? In verse 25, he continues and says in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. Shall we drink together? Will you sing this with me again? Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Before you go, a couple of things we want to let you know about. Um, if you're a first time here at Living Stone Church uh, and you've not filled a visitor's card out, we have a bunch of them on the back table. Fill one of those out, put it in the offering box before you go. Also, we have uh, those connect cards on the digital bulletin, and that's really the kind of the cool way to do it. Uh, we prefer it that way because I get those connect cards, and um, I don't have to try and figure out your hieroglyphics handwriting on the visitor's card. Great way to do that, okay? That's the digital bulletin. Also, um, small groups are going on at Livingstone Church, and so, <coughs> excuse me, they're listing there. They're listed there on our bulletin. If you want to look at that, new members class is next Sunday after church. If you want to be part of that, we do not pass a plate here at Livingstone Church. Uh, we have offering boxes in the back. If you want to honor God with your tithes and offerings, many of you are uh, giving online. Most of you are, and so thank you for your support. God is good, and all the time. <laughs>